me to, the, me to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, and uh, we're going back to the sermon series, The Road Less Traveled. The Bible tells us that we should enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. There, there is a broad road, a wide road, and most people go down that broad way, but the end of that broad way is a certain destruction. Uh, but there is another road. Uh, it is the road less traveled. The entry gate into that road less traveled is Jesus. It's a road that not many people take, but it is a, a road uh, filled with love, joy, peace, long suffering. It's the road I'm on and I want to stay on. The road less traveled. And uh, we've looked at the road less traveled. We looked at Jesus on the road less traveled. We looked at God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit on the road less traveled. We look uh, at baptism on the roads less traveled, the Word of God on the road less traveled. We looked at the family on the road less traveled. This morning, we're going to look at the mind or your mind on the road less traveled. And it's interesting, the book of Philippians written in the church in Philippi, had uh, some struggles with the mind, some difficulties with the mind. And as you begin to read this and look at this, uh, the Apostle Paul directs the church to be of one mind. He directs the church to have a mind like Christ. He directs the people to forget the uh, things of the past and make sure you have a mind centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting as you read the book of Philippians, how much is spoken or preached about, about your mind. So if you can, in, in honor of God's word, stand with me. We're going to start by reading in unison Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Then we're going to turn over to Philippians chapter 2 and read the first five verses there in Philippians chapter 2. Let's start in verse number 27. Ready? Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Right there in verse 27, one mind, church, be with one mind. Chapter 2, if you will, let's start in verse number 1, we'll read the first five verses together. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And you see the mind spoken of. Hey, church, be of one mind. Have lowliness of mind. Let uh, this mind which is in Christ be also in you. Have the mind of Christ. And we're going to look at your mind on the road less traveled. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I love you, Lord. And this is such an important truth. I pray that you help me to decrease, you to increase. Help fill me full of your Holy Spirit and your power. God, I pray that you help us to have a unified church. We're unified in one mind, and we have your mind, Lord. And I pray that you help some people who struggle in the battle of their mind to learn how to have victory over that. Lord, we need you. We, sir, love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, we're going to look at your mind, the mind on the road less traveled, your, your mind. Your thoughts, your thinking, your memory, your opinion, your intellect, the, the way you're inclined to think, and uh, your mind. I was traveling about a month ago on Makash, which is right here in the neighborhood, and I wasn't going very fast, but there was a big pothole in the middle of the road, and I swerved out of the way, and I passed one of the neighbors right there, and he looked at me and he goes, and uh, I thought I'd been out of my mind. He thought I wasn't sober-minded. And uh, a few weeks later, just a couple weeks ago, I uh, was witnessing, and I went by him, and he looked at me. He goes, he did the same thing. He goes, he said, you're the preacher that's got a drinking problem. And, uh, but praise the Lord, 
uh, the mind, your mind. Yesterday evening, I had a man call me who had gotten one of our gospel booklets, and he was traveling to New, through New Mexico on his way to California, and he'd gotten one of hold of our booklets, like I said, and as he began to talk with me, he said, Pastor, he said, I need to talk to you. He said, there's people uh, dressed in red and there's people dressed in black and they're trying to convince me that I'm from Sweden and Jesus is not God. And I said, really? I said, are you sure? He said, oh yeah, pastor, they're trying to convince me that I'm from Sweden. I'm not making this up, but he went on for quite a while and uh, he asked me, pastor, is the rapture taking place? And I said, where are you going? He said, California. I said, good. So <laughs> I didn't really say that, but... It's the land of fruits and nuts, amen, and so uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. But I don't think he was of his right mind, and so uh, the other day when we were in Washington, D.C., uh, we got out of our hotel, and uh, we began to walk towards the Capitol building. We are going to the Bible Museum, and then we are going to go over to this, uh, the, uh, the Air and Space Museum, but as we began to walk down the street, on the other side of the street was a lady and she took her bag of stuff and all of a sudden began yelling and screaming. And they went, rah, and threw all of her stuff. It went all over the ground. And you stopped and you watched her and she picked it all up. And I didn't know what was going on. Then she took her stuff again and threw it against the window of this building. And she began yelling. She turned around and yelled at the people around her. And then she began to cross the street over towards us. We stopped. Uh, and she kept going and yelling at people as she went. She obviously was not in her right mind. And uh, praise the Lord, she would have fit in right here at Grace Baptist Temple, I believe. Uh, but this morning, your mind, your thoughts, your way of thinking, your memory, your opinion, uh, the way you're inclined to think. Now, the, the book of Philippians, written in the church at Philippi. Uh, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 16 about the founding of that church. The Apostle Paul, Silas, went across the Aegean Sea they made it to the city of Philippi. And you remember on the Sabbath day, they went down to the riverside where was a, there was a woman named Lydia, a seller of purple. She was a Jew who believed in God, but she didn't believe that the Messiah had come. She didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ. And Paul took the word of God and said, oh, you've missed it. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. She got gloriously saved. They baptized her. The Apostle Paul didn't stop there. He went into the city of Philippi and began to preach the gospel, tell people about the Lord. And after a while, there was a young woman, a soothsayer, a demon-possessed lady that began to follow Paul, began to follow Silas, and began to mock him. And for three days this happened. Here she followed the Apostle Paul. She was not of the right mind. And the Lord used the Apostle Paul after three days to finally cast the demon out of her. She was then in her right mind, and the people who had used her and manipulated her situation to make money, they began to get upset with the Apostle Paul and Silas and took them and, and bound them, took them to the authorities, and Paul and, and Silas were beaten, thrown into prison. And what, what did they do at midnight? Uh, they sang praises to the Almighty God. They glorified God in their tribulation, in their difficulties. And then at midnight, the earth began to quake. The Lord sent an earthquake, and a miracle happened. The jail cells opened, and the Philippian jailer, knowing he's in trouble, says, What must I do to be saved? The Apostle Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Uh, Paul and Silas were uh, shortly thereafter let out of prison. They started the foundation of the Philippian church and moved on. Now, Paul wrote back to this church, wrote back to the church about the mind and the struggles of the mind. Different people in the church, from Lydia to the soothsayer to the Philippian jailer, real people who had a struggle between the ears with the mind. And he wanted to talk to them about the control of the mind, the use of the mind, the importance of the mind. Go back with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter 1, and look with me at verse number 27 again. And I'll read it. Philippians 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind. One what? Mind. One mind. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. Look at chapter 2 again, verse number 2. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be 
like-minded. Oh, church, be of one mind. Church, uh, be like-minded. The importance of being of one mind. And that's point number one, be of one mind. Uh, your thoughts, church, your thinking, church, church of Philippi, your memory, your opinion, your intellect, your way of thinking, the way you're thinking, church, needs to be like-minded. Think the same. Uh, be, have unity of mind. Be like-minded. Be of one mind. See my two brains right here? They represent uh, a brain, your mind, the way you think. And you think about the people of the city of Philippi. Maybe this one right here is the Philippian jailer. Maybe this one right here is Lydia, seller of purple. He's saying, hey, uh, Lydia, hey, uh, Philippian jailer, your minds need to be, be the same. You need to be in unity of mind. Think the same way. Be in agreement together. Be, uh, uh, be in agreement. Uh, the, a church that does not have the same mind has a lot of problems. Philippian jailer thinks this way. Lydia, seller of purple, think, uh, seller of purple thinks this way. They've got problems. Can two walk together? except they be agreed, absolutely not. Hey, the church that does not have the same mind has a lot of problems. Hey, church, be like-minded. By the way, 2,000 years later, he's saying to the church here, Grace Baptist Temple, church, uh, you, your mind, church, be of the same mind. Think alike. Uh, have agreements in your mind. Have unity of mind. Be like-minded. Romans chapter 8 speaks of, well, let me read this. Romans chapter 8, verses 5, 6, and 7. It says, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Interesting, interesting portion of Scripture. For to be carnally minded is death. If you could think of one mind, carnal mind, uh, thinking like the world thinks, thinking of the way uh, Satan thinks, for to be carnally minded is death. A thinking that is carnally minded doesn't lead to joy, but it leads to misery. Carnally minded is death. But then it speaks of the spiritual mind. There is another way of thinking. There's spiritually minded. And it mentions the law of God, the word of God. Uh, carnally minded, uh, somebody who's carnal minded does not think along the lines of the scripture. Their thinking goes this way. Spiritually minded people go towards the law of the Lord, the Bible. So you have two types of thinking, carnal thinking, spiritual thinking. Carnal thinking leads to death. Spiritually minded leads to life and peace. We like life, we like peace. Spiritually mind goes to life and peace. Carnal mind leads to death. Uh, the carnal mind, uh, think about this. If this was your brain right here, think of not two, but one brain right there. You've, you've heard a phrase in the Bible in James chapter 1, verse 8. It says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And think about it, if your mind is trying to go both directions, uh, a little bit spiritual, a little bit carnal, you got some problems. You're unstable in all your ways. Even your thinking in your own mind's not correct because you're double-minded. Uh, spiritually minded, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says for this, it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Mind that goes towards the law of God right here has peace. It's a sound mind. It's a wonderful mind. And this speaks both of salvation and living. Carnal, carnally minded right here uh, is not uh, good because a carnal mind right here, there's enmity between you and God. There's a problem. And somebody who's carnally minded uh, has never been saved. Somebody who's never been saved can't even comprehend to spiritually, be spiritually minded. They don't have the, the Holy Spirit living within them. By the way, a Christian who is gloriously saved has the Holy Spirit living with them can have a carnal mind right there, but it's what it's, it's grieving the Holy Spirit which lives inside of you. And it's so important, be of one mind church, don't have a carnal mind church, hey, have a spiritual mind church. Oh, now that leads to a question, what type of mind have you had, you had over the last week? Have you had a carnal mind or have you had a spiritual mind? What type of mind uh, would picture you a carnal mind over the last year or spiritually minded? How about what pictures your family? Do you have a, 
a carnally minded family or do you have a spiritually minded family? And that's so important. What about us church? What kind of church do we have? Do we have a carnally minded church? Do we have a spiritually minded church? Hopefully as a church we are unified of one mind spiritually speaking. Now, we go on, if you go to chapter 2 and look with me a little bit further, and one of the highlights of the scripture, we get to Philippians chapter 2, verse number 5. Paul says, be of one mind, be of one mind, be of one mind. Then verse 5 it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Read that verse with me. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Oh, Philippian church. Hey, I said to be of one mind. Uh, Philippian church, I said to be like-minded, but it's so important, church, that you be like-minded like the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about Jesus. If this was uh, the mind of Jesus, uh, the thoughts of Jesus, the thinking of Jesus, the memories of Jesus, the opinions of Jesus, uh, the way Jesus thinks. Jesus had perfect thinking. And by the way, we could put it towards this. Uh, the Word of God shows the thinking of God. The Word of God shows us how Jesus uh, walked, how He talked, and talked about His living. So you could think of the mind of Christ as perfectly aligned with the Scriptures. Jesus had perfect thinking. Jesus had a perfect mind. Jesus' mind was always inclined in the perfect way. Because Jesus had a perfect mind, His thinking was always spiritual. Uh, his living was always uh, right living. He always lived a spiritual life. He led the perfect life. He always went to the right place. Jesus always did the right things. He always had the perfect priorities. His perfect mind always led to perfect actions. Let this mind, which was in Christ, the perfect mind, the perfect way, the perfect thinking, it says, hey, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, Christ Jesus. It's saying, take your mind and align your mind with the thinking of Christ. Take your mind and put it over here where the mind of Jesus is at. Oh, this is such a tremendous way to think. Let this mind be in you. Hey, forget what you think. Uh, forget what you know and align your thinking with the, Lord, the Word of God, the Word of God. Went to the Bible Museum and uh, boy, the line was, it was just massive lines on the outside. We had tried to get tickets. They were sold out of the tickets. And we tried to still get in. There was just no hope of getting in. And I'm thankful that a lot of people were going to the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C. But right outside, the crowds right there was a stand. Right outside the Bible Museum where all they were. And it was a group of Jehovah Witnesses right there at the Bible Museum. And it's interesting, the Bible Museum... And they began to uh, try to be witnesses, uh, try to witnesses of their religion. And I just happened just to get in a conversation with them. <laughs> I didn't mean to. Uh, well, I probably did. And, uh, but but our, our conversation was directed toward Jesus and the Bible. And according to the scriptures, it's very obvious that Jesus is God. Amen. When you look at the Word of God... It aligns our thinking. Our thinking goes to like this, Jesus is God. Um, our thinking shows that hell is literally a place of flame and fire, and it's uh, for whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And when we align our thinking like that with the Bible, it changes. Now them, I, I said to them, I said, now listen, the Bible says this. Can't be denied. And I said, the problem is, is your thinking, your Jehovah false witnesses, what they did was rather than submitting to the Word of God, change the Word of God. Many people question what you believe, that Jesus is God, and show you in the Scriptures that Jesus is God. So rather than submitting to the Word of God, you came out with your Jehovah uh, Witness Bible, the New World Translation, that takes Jesus being God out of there. And so I said to them, you have to one day stand before the Almighty mighty God and give an account of yourself. And according to Scriptures, Jesus is God. He's the only way to heaven. Hell is real. Now, they didn't much like that, but the problem is, is there's many people who, rather than desiring the mind of Christ, desire to have the mind of their own way, their own thinking, their own desires, maybe even somebody else's way of thinking, their own desires, a religion's way of thinking. But it's saying, hey, Paul says, hey, church of Philippi, make sure you that be like-minded, be of one mind, but make sure that your mind is aligned with the mind of Christ. Be in line, in tune with that mind of Christ. Does that make sense? So we go a little bit further. It doesn't end there. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 3. 
Be of one mind. And make sure your one-mindedness is the mind of Christ. Then this is really interesting. Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 12. Let me read this portion of Scripture. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Philippi. He says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Now stop right there. Paul's writing, he says, listen, I'm trying to do my best, but I, I haven't arrived yet. I've got a long ways to go. I've got a long ways to grow. Uh, and boy, uh, yes, I was there as your spiritual leader. Uh, I've, I've tried to do right with the Lord, but I've got a long way. I'm enjoying the journey. I'm trying to get closer with the Lord. Does that make sense? Then he says this, and it says, uh, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto you have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Okay. Paul was saying, listen, we, we, we're, we haven't arrived yet. We want the mind of Christ. We should be of one mind. But there's a problem. Sometimes we've got to forget those things which are behind. We've got to go away from what we've learned in the past. We've got to go away from the things that we had thought in the past. Think for a second, uh, Lydia, seller of purple. Think of this as the mind of Lydia. She was convinced that, G, uh, that Jesus was not the Christ. She was convinced that there was going to be coming a Messiah one day. Paul said, no, no, Jesus is the Messiah. It is the Christ. She had to forget all the traditions, all the things she had believed in the past, and she had to align herself with the mind of Christ. He's saying, forget those things. Align your mind with Christ. Be of one cord around the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the soothsayer. Boy, think about, think about her. She cast a demon out of her. She had a lot of sin in her past. She had to forget the what she has taught maybe as her family, as those people, and she had to align her mind with the things of, of Christ. Think about the jailer. The jailer uh, were known as vile, uh, wicked people. And oh, this jailer had to put those things. He joined that church. He got gloriously saved. And boy, he had to align his mind with the mind of Christ. He had to forget those things which were behind. He pressed towards the mark, trying to get his mind correct. Okay, another way to illustrate this or, or help you. I, I was in the hotel lobby yesterday morning, and I went to the breakfast. And we we're in this big hotel, and I had so many people there. The breakfast was packed. They didn't have enough seats, and there was a... Uh, a place where you could get waffles. And I decided I really wanted to make my waffle, the waffle iron, and I wanted a waffle yesterday morning, so I was going to stand in line and wait to get my waffle. And as I'm standing in line, we slowly moved out. There was an elderly man behind me, and we began to talk. And uh, he was 88 years of age. He was hard of, hard of seeing, and so I helped him uh, be able to pour his waffle uh, mix right there, and we began to talk. And he told me that he is a life long Jew. He's been going to the Jewish synagogues for his whole life. Uh, and he told me all these different things. And I began to say, well, I'm a Christian. And I began to talk with him about uh, Jesus being the Christ, the Messiah. And he says, oh, I believe in the Messiah. I believe in the Christ, but he's not here yet. And I said, oh, you, you believe Daniel, don't you? Your prophet Daniel in the Old Testament. He says, oh, yeah. And I said, remember Daniel, uh, it says in the Bible, it says that Daniel prophesied or told us exactly when the Messiah was going to come. From the going forth of the establishment to rebuild uh, Jerusalem unto the coming of the Messiah shall be 483 uh, uh, years, it says. And it's a prophecy right there. And I begin to say, the prophecy said he was going to come, which was exactly fulfilled in, uh, in, in, in when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem in about 30 A.D., and as you begin to talk with him, he'd never heard that before. And it was a struggle for him. And I said, you got to think about that. Your Daniel, your prophet, said when the Messiah was going to come, and yet he was struggling because his beliefs and his mind was not aligned with the, the Word of God. It was aligned with tradition. It was aligned with many other things. 
And his only hope for heaven is to one day to align his thinking over here and realize, hey, the Messiah has already come. His name is Jesus. He needs to forget those things which are behind and align his thinking over here to what is correct. Correct. Forgetting those things which are past. So important for you. So important for me to forget those things which are past. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different uh, cultures, you might say. And forgetting those cultures or those backgrounds or those thoughts that take us away and put our minds purposely over here as a church where we have the mind of Christ. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to be of one mind. We're to be like-minded. We're to forget those things of the past. And our whole goal is to align ourselves as a church with the mind of Christ where we think alike, we act alike, we talk alike. Though we're different, we're the same. Hey, Lydia, seller of purple, soothsayer, Philippian jailer, they could be in one accord in the church because they had the mind of Christ. Amen. Now, the end, sort of the conclusion, I titled my conclusion part this. Just a couple of mindful thoughts. Not a very thoughtful congregation this morning. Just a couple of mindful thoughts. Uh, number one under the couple of mindful thoughts is the simplicity that is in Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, it says these words. It says, but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, though your minds should be corrupted from, though your minds, your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And it warned us right there, the simplicity that is in Christ. There's one way to heaven, it's Jesus. There's not many ways to heaven, there's one way. It's not Jesus plus you. It's not Jesus plus the church. It's not Jesus plus getting baptized. It's not being a Baptist. It's not being a Catholic. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. It's so important. Let this mind be in you, the mind of the simplicity that is in Christ. Don't be corrupted from another way or another religion, another thought. Jesus is the only way to heaven. We're all sinners bound for hell. Jesus paid that price on the old rugged cross, rose from the grave, proving he was God. The only way to heaven is to call out, Lord, I'm in trouble, save me. Amen. Number two, uh, number two on just a couple of mindful thoughts. Number two is renew your mind. Renew your mind. The mind of Christ is over here. A lot of times our mind has been corrupted. Maybe not yours, but probably mine. But Romans chapter 12 Verse 2 says this, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In today's world, we're taught, do what you please. Do what you want. What If it feels good, do it. Have it your way. What you desire. If it's good for you, it's good for you. Everybody do by the way, the book of Judges, every man did that which was right in their own eyes. In today's world, we're taught the world system, the world's ways, and our minds are often over here so in, um, in I, I could say, corrupted from the world. And it's saying, hey, the only hope to, for you is to renew your mind, make it new again, wash away the filthiness and renew your mind, transformed over here to have the mind of Christ. Okay. So the simplicity that is in Christ, renew your mind. Then, then this, be spiritually minded, not carnally minded. Amen. Be spiritually minded, not carnally minded. The spiritually minded live a spiritual life. The carnal, spiritually minded, live a spiritual life. The carnally minded live a life of carnality. Okay, do you understand that? Spiritually minded, uh, live a spiritual life. Carnal mind lives a carnal life. Uh, you think about it. The Bible, uh, spiritually minded, put a high priority on the Word of God. That's another sermon for another day, but it's true. The Word of God shows us the mind of Christ, and you want to get the mind of Christ, you've got to learn about the mind of Christ. The Word of God shows the mind of Christ. You can know it, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. But you can know Christ through the Word of God, so you align it. So the spiritually minded are looking at the Word of God. 
Carnal mind, not so much. Amen? Have you read your Bible this week? Oh, the spiritually minded uh, put a priority on God's institution, the church. Uh, Thou art Peter, and Jesus said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And Jesus said, put a priority on church. Church, a place where the word of God is preached, the word of God is taught, uh, lives are transformed, people are encouraged, people are strengthened. Uh, carnal mind, meh, what's the big deal about a church? But, but spiritually minded people say, hey, God put a priority in church. You know, pastor does say some, sometimes, three to thrive, Sunday morning, Sunday night. A carnally minded person would look at that and say, ah, what's the big deal? Spiritually minded say, well, if it's important to God, it's important to me. Amen. Boy, you could go on. Um, I, I got this article from the Washington Post uh, dated September 24th, 1988. This is really interesting. And I thought about it. Our nation, before I read this article, our nation, I like our, I like United States of America. Amen. Not a perfect nation, but our nation was a nation built on Christian principles uh, as a whole. Not perfect, no, but I like our nation as a whole. It put a priority on the Almighty God. And it's interesting as we see our nation getting farther away from by, the, uh, God uh, the lives of, of the nation of the United States change. So, have you ever heard of blue laws? Now, the younger generation may have never heard or even know what blue laws are. How many of you know what blue laws are? Okay, mostly older people. Uh, it's true. But there were blue laws even in the state of Virginia. This article dates back to less than 30 years ago, 29 years ago, September 24th, 1988. It's a fascinating article. But here's, here's what it says. Virginia laws prohibiting Sunday shopping and dating back before the days of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were declared unconstitutional yesterday by the state Supreme Court here in Virginia. Hundreds of stores in Norfolk, Roanoke, Virginia Beach, and Hampton Roads will be affected by the ruling, prosecutors said. Yesterday's decision erases a law that survived from 1610 to 1960 with few changes. Recently, however, the laws ran up against significant social changes. Among them, an increasing number of women working full-time and shopping on weekends. For many, the advent of malls also transformed shopping into a recreation pastime. And Sunday itself is not the day of church and family dinners that it once was. Virginia, Sunday, Virginia's Sunday closing laws, they, they wouldn't have stores or, or restaurants open on Sundays. Uh, you couldn't even get gas on Sundays. Do You know, that made a priority where people would say, it's the Lord's Day, we're going to church. By the way, you'd never have the excuse, I work on Sunday, because they didn't. It was a day for family. It was a day for church. It was a day for God. Social changes began to change that. It says this, but for many residents in Tidewater and southern parts of Virginia, Sunday shopping just isn't done. This is 1988. It's saying people in Tidewater, even today, 1988, we just don't go shopping on Sundays. It's interesting because look, look at this. Numerous times voters in Virginia Beach and other jurisdictions have opposed repealing the blue laws. As recently as 1982, listen to this, 64% of voters in Norfolk rejected a referendum proposing the law's repeal. repeal. In 1982, 64% of people in Norfolk said, we don't want to do away with the blue laws, we like them. Why? Because as a whole, society had a respect for God, society had a respect for church, had a respect for the things of God. But as the time has changed, those things have been repealed. It says, by most accounts, blue laws got their their name from a paper they were written on and later came to refer to laws on morality and prohibiting certain Sunday's activity. But the nation has gone like this. The United States has gone like this, our morality thinking, spiritually minded to going this slowly but surely. And maybe we're right here. Maybe we haven't even seen the end of it yet. But we're getting like this quickly. Very anti-God, very anti-church, very anti-the-Bible. 
Now, we, growing up in that society, living in that society, uh, really every day in that society, we have to rebel against this way of thinking. We have to rebel against thinking like the world thinks. We have to take and pull of our brains out over here and say, no, no, we're not going to live like that. We're going to have the mind of Christ. Our family is going to have the mind of Christ. Me as an individual is going to have the mind of Christ. We as a church are not going to be a carnal church. We're going to be a church that has a mind like Christ. Spiritual minded. To be spiritually minded is life, but to be carnally minded is death. And the pressure to pull us this way is so great. You have the whole world and whole, all of Satan pulling us and pulling us and pulling us and even breaking the stick and pulling us this direction. We have to say, no, no, no. We have to forget the way we were brought up often. We have to think, forget the way we were taught. We have to forget all of that. Say, it doesn't matter what I thought. Lydia had to do it. It doesn't matter what I've taught. Jesus is the Christ. It doesn't matter the soothsayer woman. For me to live as Christ, this is the way we're going to live right now. Hey, remember, spiritually minded. Now, as crazy. I want to add, so, well, so I put this. This is the second last. Saturate your mind with the things of God. Saturate your mind with the things of God. You want to help with your spiritual minded? Saturate your mind with the, the things of God. It's hard in today's world. Boy, with television, the internet, smartphones, we're inundated, flooded with carnality. We have to reject that and say, no, I'm going to flood my mind with the Word of God. The Word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's a wonderful book, it's a life-changing book, the mind of Christ right here. Then I put this, do not saturate your mind with the things of this world. Do not saturate your minds with the things of the world. Too often we're just easily, we just go, okay, we just go over here so quickly, so easily. But we as Christians, we have to reject that. Good illustration of it. Well, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 says this, speaking of Lot, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And Lot took his way of thinking away from the word of God, and he began to go over here. And you can see the struggle a little bit right here, but eventually... Just gave in. Boy, his family looked at him, and he began to try to tell them about the Lord. And he said, who are you? You've never told us that before. He vexed his, his righteous soul in seeing and hearing. Vexed it. And he got to the point he was living in Sodom and Gomorrah. It didn't bother him anymore. Sin, it's not that big of a deal anymore. In today's society, wow, are we inundated with it. Went to a restaurant on a Friday evening, and there's a big mirror, and behind there, there was, there was uh, two men who were sitting there, and uh, it was like a little cubby hole right there, and they were openly, not, not hiding anything, flaunting their sodomy. Unashamedly, uh, it was embarrassing, and my heart, it, it grieved me. It grieved the Holy Spirit, because sodomy is a sin. So an abomination to the Almighty God. And in our society, they push that sodomy is okay through schools. They preach that it's okay through television, through the internet. And even churches today are saying, what's the big deal? But God's up there and saying, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Went outside, and it's amazing how prevalent it was. I went to park my, my uh, van there, and that's hard to do in Washington, D.C., got out of there, and there was a carload of sodomites. And how do you know that? Well, you just, it, you would have you'd known. They, they're unashamedly, it was disgusting what they were doing. It was disgusting. The point being, in today's world, we can give in. We can vex our righteous soul and sing and hearing and get to the point where we say, what's the big deal? But that carnality, it leads to death. It leads to your death, spiritual death. It leads to your family, the next generation. They're not going to believe in the God of the Bible because you didn't take it serious. Your family, you're not going to have a Christian home because you can't. You have carnal carnality. Uh, this church will die. If we all of a sudden get to the big deal where we have a carnal church, carnally minded church right there, we'll die spiritually. And then what good is having church anyways? And the whole point is Paul was writing back to him saying the same things. He says, be of one mind. 
Have spiritually minded. Be like-minded. But make sure you're li lining your brain with the mind of Christ. Forget some of those things over here that you've been taught. So get some of the traditions that's been in your family. Forget some of your culture. Come over here and be spiritually minded. Live a biblical life Amen. in harmony, minded, harmony with the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's be spiritually minded. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you.